from the shores of Summer Lake in Tigard, Oregon. It's the Portland Tim Beers Podcast, a show featuring two guys who love craft beer and Portland Timbers soccer. And now, here are your hosts, Jason and Gary. Tim Beers. I'm Jason. And I'm Gary. We're the uh, Portland Tim Beers. We talk a little bit about soccer, beer, and pretty much whatever else we want. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, doing fantastic. Better than we thought we were going to do. Way better. Well, here we are, last week of Yakima Beer Month. Yes. Big uh, bail breaker interview. The, so. The big finale. And I'm uh, sliding a beer over to you from Bail Breaker. And it looks dark and creamy. This is called Wood and Wire. It's an Imperial Stout by Bale Breaker. It's part of their uh, cast condition program they've got going on. And uh, what do you think? <laughs> Let's see what this is. Bottling date was 1-9-2020. And uh, it was aged for three months in Jameson whiskey barrels. I'm tasting the Jameson whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> like a, yeah, you can definitely taste it um, on the front end. Yeah. And then you've got a very distinct chocolate kind of taste on the back end. So uh, you're kind of getting the best of both worlds out of that. Yeah, it's a uh, full on. Oak. I don't get a ton of whiskey, but I definitely get a lot of uh, a lot of the oak and heavy imperial stout. Um, it's pretty good. Lots of roasty notes on it. Yes. Um, but yeah, golden. All right, man. Well, so we're gonna do a bail break interview. This uh, sums up our Yakima beer month, and uh, it's been a wonderful month to learn about. Yakima beers and take a look at the uh, tap house scene, take a look at a couple different breweries, and also take a look at the hop side of things. Um, Fantastic hospitality by all of these folks. And uh, definitely, if you get a chance, check out the Yakima beer scene because it is clicking and popping. And really, it's the center of the universe for many things beer wise um, just because of the hop scene. But uh, very true. Yes, but they're doing some awesome things with beer there. The brewers are so. Well, so I had the chance to go visit Bale Breaker, and uh, I set this interview up. Um, it took me about a month to set this thing up. I was in town for about a month, and we're going back and forth, and they weren't open. Um, I heard they had some cast condition stuff, and so I really um, reached out and said, Hey, at the very least, if you can't do an interview... I'd like to buy some cask beers from you guys. And that was more or less the end. Um, They were like, yep, stop by. You can do that. And meanwhile, we can do the interview and we can do all of that. And so um, probably one of the best interview experiences I've ever had. So Chris Baum over at Varietal was a remarkable, cool guy, awesome setting, great beers. Um, and again, one of the top five interviews I've done, and this is easily one of the top three interviews that I've done. Um, the access that I had, looking at the centrifuge and how they're brewing and looking at the cask room, all that type of stuff, um, was unparalleled. It's fantastic. So with that, let's take a listen to this bail break interview and we'll come back and enjoy some more beers, hopefully from bail breaker so <laughs> all right this is jason from the tim beers and i am here um at bail breaker and we i know we've been talking it up on the episodes that eventually this was going to come <laughs> kevin quinn i'm here with uh founder owner of bail breaker and uh thanks kevin for having me so yeah thank you for coming out we're happy to have you so let's talk a little bit about all well, first of all let you introduce yourself to the listeners tell people about your brewery and then we'll jump into some questions Sounds good. Yeah, like you said, uh, I'm one of the two two Kevins that founded it. I founded the, or we started the brewery with uh, my wife, Megan, and I, and then her younger brother, Kevin, uh, Kevin Smith. So there's two Kevins. That gets, uh, that gets a little confusing. Um, they are, my in-laws um, 
have been in our fourth generation, uh, Megan and Kevin and their older brother, Pat, fourth generation hop farmers. Um, their great grandparents started a farm here about two miles down the road um, in 1932. Um, currently, uh, Pat is, is running it along with um, their dad, Mike. Um, and we started in the kind of very early 2010s, started thinking about doing a brewery on a, on a hop farm. We hadn't heard of anyone doing it. And um, we were able to put together a business plan, talk Mike into, into having the farm uh, help us get financing. And then we were able to build the brewery uh, right here in the middle of Field 41. So if you've ever enjoyed a Field 41 Pale Ale, that's where the name comes oh. from. We're in, we're in Hop Field number 41. Uh, used to be about 18 or 20 acres. We've knocked down probably around four acres or so now um, and have the brewery here. Uh, started in April of 2013. Um, so this year would have been our um, seventh anniversary, or I guess it still was our seventh anniversary, but uh, we were we were closed at the time. I guess we're still closed. Um, and so, yeah, started um, started out uh, with a 30-barrel brew house, three-vessel. Um, we still use that. Uh, we started with a 30-barrel tank, a 60-barrel tank, and a 90-barrel tank. Um, mm. We now still have the 30 and the 60. They're really good for kind of small batch stuff and um, small runs of, of cans that we want to get out some unique stuff. Uh, we have 990s and, and 13 120s. Um, and we distribute in most of Oregon, uh, all of Washington, uh, 10 northern counties of Idaho. And then by the, by the end of the year, we'll open up southern Idaho and we'll be in the full state of Idaho. So we'll, we'll essentially be distributing in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Fantastic. So... Talk a little bit about growth in a second, but just to remind the listeners, I drove through about three weeks ago, and I'm like, I'm going to go put eyes on Bell Breaker. I know not, they're not open. They're doing a drive through thing. I drove past the brewery. It's in the middle of the, I mean, it's gorgeous right now. Hops are blooming and doing their thing, but it's tucked back in a hop hop farm, yeah, and three, literally three it's sides. green and lush around it with golden clusters sitting there around it, and totally a cool setting. So, um, so talk about scalability. So you went from small to now massive for the craft beer industry, right? Yeah. And I can tell you, all of the people, all of the craft brewers in and around there are like, yeah, Bale Breaker's the one, they're the big one, and they're the one that's making the name for Yakima at this point. But there's almost a bend cluster effect going on that seems to have started with you guys that's kind of helping Yakima, revitalize Yakima. Yeah. What were, what were the keys to that growth? Um. Well, yeah, first off, on your, um, on your talk about the cluster, there was, I mean, kind of in the greater Yakima Valley, there was, there was two breweries when we started, like we talked about. There was, there was Yakima Craft and there was uh, Snipes, and then we opened. And now I think from, you know, Sunnyside Prosser area up to Natchez, I think it's like 9 or 10 or 11 or something now. So um, that's been great. Uh, we're totally supportive of that. Um, our philosophy is, you know, you know, Napa, it's not Napa with two brewer, you know, with two wineries, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's and there's a way that we can all help each other and we can drive more tourism here and, you know, have a vibrant industry and be able to, you know, create jobs and that sort of stuff. And so um, we're a total open book. Uh, we, you know, we have a, a, a full-fledged lab. We have a three-person full-time, you know, quality team, you know, each batch of our beer gets five quality checks before it leaves the brewery. Um, we keep a week-long quality hold. Um, no beer leaves the, leaves the brewery that hasn't passed all of that. So we offer all of all of those, um, you know, I guess services, I guess, or, or the la the testing of the beer to to all of our friends around here. Um, you know, we give them yeast. You know, we we you know we just try to help people out, and we um, you know we were. We were very, very fortunate to get back to your original question uh, about kind of the scalability. Um, obviously, we'd, we'd get a, or maybe not obviously, but this was a hop field, so it was a green field project. We were able to, to build it a little bigger. Um, our hop farm, which started at, at five acres um, in 1932, uh, this year will be about 2,200 acres of hops. And last year, we harvested over 5 million pounds. Um, we only use about like one and a half, two percent of that. All 
almost all of the rest ends up in the craft brewing industry. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, um, my father-in-law had been able to develop relationships with a lot of craft brewers. So, you know, when we'd come back for harvest, which is a very important time for the family, you know, we'd see Ken Grossman and Bren Brendan McGivney and Doug mm -hmm. Odell and, and Dan from New Glarus and Vinny and Natalie and, you know, um, Kim Jordan from uh, New Belgium, Dick yeah. Cantwell from Malaysia. You know, we were we were so fortunate that because these people were coming and, and selecting the hops off our, our farm because the farm, you know, I'm a little biased, but, you know, we make, I would say we grow at the, at the level of the best hops that, that you can get. And then, you know, by the breweries that, that select them, I think that, um, that shows the quality of the hop. But then all those people, once, once they heard that we were doing a brewery, were like, how can we help out? You know, how can we do it? I mean, Vinny Chalurzo looked at our brew house and fermenter drawings before we have them done because he's like, I know you guys are going to do hoppy beers and I do hoppy beers. So like, let me take a look at your designs and stuff. And, and from my experience of making hoppy mm -hmm. beers, I think I can have some, some good design things for you. And, you know, we had the, the full backing of, you know, Sierra and New Belgium and stuff. I mean, we were sending our malt analysis forms to, uh, you know, Christian at New Belgium and Tom at Sierra Nevada, and they were looking at me, yeah, this looks good, you know, this is fine. When we started canning, we, you know, we threw ice packs in, overnighted them to them so they can run them in the lab. And so um, we feel uh, a real big responsibility to uphold the quality standards that those guys put in place for the craft brewing industry. Mm. And, you know, I tell people this all the time, you know, all these kind of like first generation breweries that were really doing all the fight and really doing the heavy lifting and pushing that rock up the hill and then made it possible for us in, you know, 2012, 2013 to open. And at that point there was 2000 breweries and we thought we'd got in late. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember sitting around the table thinking, Jesus, did we miss the time? Like there's 2000, now there's 8,000. Right. And it, we owe a lot to those guys for breaking down the barriers so that we could really open this up and, and open up breweries. And so, um, I mean, besides just our own kind of like, like responsibility to ourselves and our, and our beer to, to do really high quality things and to help anybody out we can to, to help the quality of the craft brewing industry, you know, stay high. It's also like when we got to look at those guys in the face at, at harvest, we, we, we're not putting out a bad beer. Right. And we don't want it as much as we can help them. We don't want them to go around in any other brewery in this valley and have a beer that's not of the highest quality. So you're trying to balance quality, right, and and maintain high quality, but that doesn't always go along with growth always, right? right. So you're trying to balance that. You've got some massive sponsorships as far as, uh, or not sponsorships, but contracts. So you're now at professional sporting events where you're the beer person yeah. that's slinging beers for, what, Mariners and Seahawks? Yeah, or, Mariners yeah. and Seahawks yeah. and the Huskies. And, yeah, I mean, so, and but how do you WC. maintain that quality at the same time doing this explosive growth and I wouldn't even say explosive how about aggressive growth plan that you've been on yeah um I think they go I mean for us they went hand in hand I mean it wasn't until it wasn't until last year that we had a sales team larger than we had a quality team hmm. so um we've had a three to four person quality team and obviously the brewers help out in there too so um, and the, you know, and the seller people and everyone in production has, has parts of their job that, you know, they're up in the lab. I mean, even the packaging guys, they're checking seams and they're checking DOs and they're checking the clarity and the DOs of beers. And, you know, hmm. if it doesn't hit those specs, like anyone from, you know, our entry level packaging guy, you know, if he sees a DO number out of a bright tank, that's not right. Like he knows, whoop, stop. I gotta go talk to, I gotta go talk to Brian. Um, our, our production and quality manager, or I go talk to Jackie or my, my brother-in-law, Kevin, or if they're not, then they come up and talk to Megan and I, and it's like, hey, this isn't meeting spec. And well, if it's not meeting spec, then we're not putting it in there. Did you do that early on, like when you were slow, small and growing? Because we a did. lot of people are struggling at that point, and throwing away a batch of beer is a big yeah. thing, right? Um, yeah, no, it's a big thing. And, and I think that, I mean, obviously we don't, Brewers don't talk a lot, right, that they, right. did they throw beer out? But I think, I mean, if you talk to, to, to breweries, um, 
I would say that people dump. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say probably one to three percent of right. the beer. Like if you're running a, a good quality system, um, you can do that. I can't remember exactly who it was. You know, if it was Sierra Nevada or if it was Russian River or one of the other ones. They said, I remember this a long time ago. They told us there's two types of breweries. There's breweries that know they have infections, and there's breweries that have infections. Right. And so you better be the one that knows you have an infection. Right. And so, um, yeah, I mean, from the start, we, I mean, we didn't have as full-fledged, like, micro and stuff as we have now. Um, and so we did a lot of, you know, taste and stuff. I mean, we weren't, you know, using the distillation technique and then, you know, running our beer through a spec to see if, you know, we had any dacil in it, right? Mm-hmm. We were... We were using a water bath to warm it up, and then we were smelling it and tasting it to see if we had it. And so it wasn't at a, at a level of sophistication that it is now, but there's a lot of things that, that you can do um, to ensure that. But, yeah, it's, it's hard. I, and um, I think a lot of breweries, um, even ones that, you know, that you'll taste that have an infection, uh, like you said, it's, it's a big financial hit. Mm-hmm. And so I think... I think a lot of them know it might not be at the quality that they want, but are forced financially that they they have to do it. Um, Recan and call it experimental or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean it was hard, and we we were we used some new techniques last year and dry hopping and stuff, and and um, that we ended up getting some infections and stuff in mm-hmm. our beer, and we. Um, it was our worst year of, of doing it, but we dumped out, I can't remember what it was, four or five 120 barrel batches. Mm. And um, it's like, uh, Brian, our quality manager, or Brian and Jackie are, uh, are all, you know, they're always like, yeah, you know, we found it. And it's like, they feel bad, right? Because right. it's like, you, you invest in this quality team, you do all these tests, you spend this money investing in this quality and then when they do do their job and they find something then it costs even more (laughs) money to remedy it right and so um it's kind of hard but it that just goes back to you know just having that really high level of pride in in the beer and yeah it hurts and we you know it it slowed some rollouts of new beers and you know we definitely could have sold more beer and we probably would have sold it fast enough that no one could have told uh or could have could have known but why take that risk if you're trying to maintain a right. quality standard right yeah. so so what type of beers are you known for i mean it seems like an easy thing i'm sitting here in the middle of the hop field right i've had yeah. plenty of your beers yeah. but if you were to say look this is our style this is what we do what are you guys known for uh i mean definitely hop forward west coast style ipas um we're starting uh we just released our first full-time hazy um right before covid i had a can uh, of that yeah and so we're doing more and we're doing more haze, but yeah, I mean, a lot of hop forward beers, um, you know, another COVID casualty, um, about 10 days ago, we were supposed to launch a, a year round Pilsner and oh. we couldn't get the cans. Um, we got that on tap. So, um, that's pushed back. So now we're getting blanks and we're labeling it. And, you know, we, we heard, you know, two days before, um, actually the day that we announced that we were going to release it the next weekend, like about an hour after we made the announcement on social, we got the notice from the can manufacturer um, that they weren't going to be able to do it. Um, and so we're we're branching out now. Um, another brewery we, we look up to a lot is New Glarus, and that sells so much beer in such a small footprint. And, you know, we haven't kept it to, to our home state, but we we don't want this large distribution footprint. Like we're known for hop forward beers. We do hop forward beers. Hop forward beers don't travel very well. Mm -hmm. Like we want people to drink them fresh. Um, We want them, you know, as close to code or, you know, as close to that packaging on date as we can. And, um, and so we're now getting to the point where, you know, you either have to create more SKUs or you have to open up the territory, Mm -hmm. you know, top cutter, our flagship beer is in, you know, 98% 98% of the points of distribution, right? We don't have a lot to do that. Field 41, you know, same thing. Bottom cutter, our Imperial IPA, same thing. Um, Hazy L's got some, some some room to run, but I think it probably opened up with, you know, 40 or 50% distribution. But we're getting to this point where it's like, we can't just keep releasing IPAs, and we make a lot of other 
types of beers. Well, you have your flagships, right? And then you've got to release new stuff to kind of keep people interested. Yeah. Stay relevant in the market, kind of chase some trends. Yeah. So. And then we we sprinkle those in too, but then also, you know, to keep that volume growth, we got to find new year-round beers that aren't just going to cannibalize what we got on there. Right. So um, we're really excited about the Pilsner. Um, We got a couple horizontal lagering tanks, um, and so we're doing it pretty pretty traditional, uh, real clean. Um, but, um, one of the other things we started doing last year was, uh, we, we grew barley for the first time. And this year we, uh, yesterday we finished harvesting, but this year we grew two different types of barley, Copeland and, and Franson. Um, we grew some wheat and some oats. And so where are you we, having a malted? Uh, great Western's doing the majority okay. of it down in Vancouver. They're going to do um, 50 tons of Franson and 50 tons of Copeland for us. Wow. Um, and then we'll probably send, you know, 15 to 20 tons of Franson and Copeland each to Link and Spokane. Okay. Uh, and then that's also where we're sending the wheat and the oats to be malted. Um, and so we have a, you know, homegrown, essentially a state beer. We released it for the first time last fall. We've had three releases of it. Um, we're going to release a uh, wet hop of it um, this year. Again, going back to kind of like our, our idols, our, our one of our big mentors is Sierra Nevada. And so we've always wanted to get to a point where we could, you know, have a beer that we grew all the ingredients. And, and so um, obviously they have their Northern Hemisphere wet hop beer that they do with that's their barley mm-hmm. and, and their hops. And so um, we're perfectly situated to do it. And we, we have, we have land and we have, great farmers and, and agronomists on the on the farming side and so um i don't think we'd grown grain i think my father-in-law said he grew some in the 70s when he first took it over and and um uh, brent one of the uh, my my father-in-law's cousin you know can grow anything and so he did a great job last year and then this year the yield was we got 35 tons out of roughly 20 acres last year we got about 140 tons out of 40, 40 acres this year, and then I don't, I didn't, I didn't even hear what our what our total haul was, but we were expecting about 10 tons each of wheat and oats. How fantastic is that to grow? I mean, we're in one of the only regions in the Northwest where you have access to hops, you have access to clean water, and you have access to grains, let alone growing your own grains. I mean. Yeah. We live in such a great area for beer and one of the best places in the world for beer. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's massive that you're doing that. So. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, like I said, we'll release a wet hop, and then um, and then we'll have a, a a bigger release in in the fall of the of the homegrown beer. So, talk to me about brewing experience. How'd you break into this? Largely, our our listenership are small craft guys breaking in, just leaving home brewing, and then certainly home brewers. Um, talk, yeah, I talk mean, a little about your experience. Yeah, we started um, probably very similar to how um, a lot of a lot of your listeners started. Uh, we brewed our our first batch here, uh, Pat, who's who runs the farming side now, got a homebrew kit. Um, Megan and I drove over from Coeur d'Alene. Kevin drove over from Seattle, where he was living at the time. We met at Pat's house down here in downtown Yakima, five-gallon extract batch. It was a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale clone. Mm. We did that as soon as Megan and I got back to Coeur d'Alene. We were lucky enough there was a homebrew shop just you know a mile or so away from the house. Mm. Went there. Bought a turkey fryer burner, you know, a seven-gallon stainless steel pot, and then, you know, and some carboys and um, and some cornies, and we just started, um, we just started home brewing. Um, and then where we kind of stepped up our home brew game um, when, was when the farm um, turned an old milk house into like a little home brew, nano brewery thing, and we got a... Uh, we had a 10 gallon Sabco Brew Magic. Um, mm-hmm. We had two 14 gallon, from, or excuse me, three 14 gallon fermenters. One was um, the uh, like temperature controlled one, mm-hmm. um, and then two 27 gallon ones, so it's two double batch ones. And in the spring of 2012, when we had made the decision that, you know, uh, Megan and I were quitting our jobs, and, and Kevin was brewing and brewing at two beers at the time and so he was kind of doing both but i mean he had committed that he that we were going to do this too um and we up and moved in march and we 
Um, and we started working on top cutter and 41 recipes and Kevin and Megan and I um, logged, I can't remember what it was, like 150 batches in 2012 on wow. Sabco. Um, and so that's where we really kind of dialed in our repeatability and, and um, we were actually very, um, Pat and Megan are definitely on kind of like the analytical side and Kevin's a super creative guy which is why he's our brewmaster and he's got a great mind for for recipes if you if you've had our beers um, but like we started with the malt bill and then we started with bittering hops and then we went to late kettle edition hops and then we went to we bought one of those little like torpedo things because we knew we wanted a hot back again going back to Sierra Nevada yeah. um, you know they have a hot back on there on their pilot system and so we knew we were going to have a hot back and then so then we went to just hot backs and um, hops, like what we were going to put in there. And then we would bought the homebrew shop or hometown Ace Hardware here in Yakima out of their corny cakes so many times. I think <laughs> at one point we had 40 or 40 probably corny cakes, I bet. And then we would do a double batch into the 27-gallon fermenters. It net us about 20 gallons. And we had some uh, stainless steel mesh that could go over the dip tube in the corny. And then we would mix up four different dry hops for you know that same base that mm. we had and we'd throw it in the cornies and we'd dry hop like that um and then we'd try them and we would do like double blind yeah, sensory yeah, yeah. on the stuff until we nailed our recipe and then when we got the recipe that we were happy with you know the brewers that we knew in the industry was like okay you did it once do it now again. you got to do it a zillion <laughs> other times and so then it was like all right we're making top cutter in 41 and then you know, we didn't keep those fermenters empty. I mean, they were always they were always filling up. I mean, th we had this teeny little air conditioner in there, but you know, when it's 105 in Yakima, I mean, it's 80, 90 in there. We would um, we would ice down towels to put them on the fermenters, and we had fans blowing on those to try to keep them at temperature. And we'd set alarms at night to come out and and switch the um, and switch the the ice towels. And then you know, we did you know. We'd go out and pull vines down for our wet hop beers, or the, the wet hop beer that we did there. Uh, we actually licensed that. So technically, I said we opened we opened this facility, our production facility, in, in April of 2013. We technically got our brewer's notice, um, and that milk house and that 10-gallon Sabco was the first was our first brewery that we uh, that we had licensed, mm -hmm. um, and so we let, we got it licensed so we could go to the Fresh Hop Ale Festival. Um, I believe we got third place, um, and then we would, um, we broke ground on this facility in August and finished it in February, um, and then, you know, so like our first release to the public was Fresh Hop in October, then, you know, to get a half, to get a two half barrels worth of beer took us, you know, three weeks, and right. then so once a month, then so then november december january february march april well then april we opened you're doing a build up we would do a we would do one event a month and we'd only have two kegs and so the first one one top cutter keg 141 poured out in like less than an hour um and then same thing at the next one same thing at the next one so then it was kind of building up this demand and yeah then in april we opened april 2013 we opened um, and, uh, yeah, we, we actually decided not to open our tap room before we sent beer out in the market because we wanted to, you know, we are a production brewery. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can get into a story about how poorly we projected what our tap room sales were going to be in a good, <laughs> in a good way. But so we distributed beer out Friday, the 12th, April 12th, and then did three events around town at, at some of the bars that we had sent the beer to and then opened our tap room April 13th and total depletion. Yeah, we had, I think we delivered John might remember, um, John, a, a friend of ours, um, grew up with, with, uh, Megan and her brothers. And then John and I were randomly roommates in, in college. Um, he was our first employee. He's, he's still with us and, um, he does, uh, sales for us. And he originally, was the one who got our, our self-distribution, our, our Yakima sales. And then obviously, well, then we were, he, he was, he was our only sales guy for 
until 2018. Hmm. Uh, and I would help him out on it, but early on in the days I was brewing too, so I wasn't much help. But, um, well, I guess we didn't have a lot of tanks, so I did have some days that we would spend in the markets. But uh, I think we probably delivered north of 50 kegs. Hmm. I think it was three three trips and a three-quarter ton long bed. Wow. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Well, talk to me. We talked a little bit before we started the interview about the Yakima beer scene. What's going on in Yakima? Um, I know it's trying to make it kind of make a resurgence back to being kind of a beer town, beer focused town. Yeah. What do you see that's working here? What do you see as places that maybe need some help or need some improvement? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the Yakima scene, when, when we opened, I mean, in the Yakima, you know, greater Yakima area, there was only uh, Yakima Craft. Um, and they had been around for five or six years before um, we opened. Um, and then it was us for a while. Uh, us and Yakima Craft, and then over the last, you know, two, three years, um, the beer scene's really exploded. Um, we got our friends down at Varietal that opened, our friends at Single Hill that opened, um, Braun Yar, um, Wandering Hop, Valley Brewing, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some, uh, Birchman's Brewing opened, there was Redford's Brewing here for a time, um, and yeah, and then in the last few years, it, it kind of went from you know two or three in the in the greater valley to you know I think there's north of ten, mm. um, and so it's it's great. I think they're they're all doing great things, and it's kind of interesting to see kind of where people are trying trying to focus. Um, you know, some of the newer breweries are doing a lot of a lot of hazies, um, and it's. I don't know if we influence that because we because Top Cutter is a West Coast style IPA, right. but people are people are making great beers, um, you know, uh, and they were kind of jealous a bit about, um, you know, kind of the ability just to, you know, just to do. I'm just going to do this beer because I'm going to do this beer, and I might never brew it again. And we have a five barrel system that that we get to do that, but you know, with a lot of the on premise closed and stuff or limited. Um, we used to, we we crank last year we cranked out north of a hundred batches out of the, out of the five barrel system. So a good fair amount of experimentation. And, yeah, you know. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean uh, it's it's very healthy. Um, you know, well because it was very healthy going into COVID. Um, you know, we were we were kind of um, it was kind of our first year that we flattened out last year. Um, we didn't have some new products to go in the grocery store. You know, we lost a little bit of distribution with some of our, our, our older year round beers. And so we kind of flattened out and we were, you know, like, you know, man, that would be cool if we just sold everything over the counter, you know, and it was like, you know, we control this and we're not at the mercy of, you know, the Safeway or Albertsons, right. you know, I mean, we, we lost field 41 distribution for Safeway because they, they had their own pale ale that was going on and ours was the best selling pale ale. So they took it out. So they took us out. So it's like, there's a lot of stuff that's out of your control that way. Um, but it, it sure saved us this year. I mean, we were 70% distributed in, in six packs. That was 70, like at the end of 2019, it was 70% of our sales. Mm-hmm. And so granted we lost 30% of our sales, but you know, if you're a hundred percent on premise and you got to close for two months, um, you know, that's real difficult. So I see, I mean, kind of that's, that's the biggest threat. I mean, the, the beer quality in, in Yakima as a whole, um, you know, as part of my job, I manage the sales and distribution. So I travel all over, you know, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And I, you know, I'd say we, on, on average, all the beer in Yakima is a higher quality than I see in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest, I think the biggest threat is just kind of how many of them are going to be able to, to weather this, this, this COVID and, you know, are we going to, I mean, we're still in phase one, so I don't think we can go back. It's a, um, I had a couple other jobs before we started this, but one of them was finance and people used to say, you can't fall from the floor. You know, when a stock was so low, they were like, well, I mean, you know, you might as well get it. You know, it can't go any lower. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like, we're in phase one. So like people are worried about stepping back. I mean, we can't really step back into in, right. any lower phase. So hopefully for Yakima County, you know, things will keep opening back up and just hopefully, you know, as the, as the whole region is a, as a whole and, and the nation, we, 
don't see that big spike and have to close things down again because I think that'll be a real, real, real difficult for people. You know, once you've brought people back and you've, you know, it was one thing when you're closed and hopefully you got some PPP money and, you know, your expenses were a lot lower. Well, now you're open again. And so people are going to have to close again. And I think this goes for not just breweries, a bunch of small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's going to be, you know, bad news for a lot of small yeah, businesses. Yeah, I mean, restaurants, I mean, are obliterated right now. Oh, yeah. And <clears throat> I just saw a report this morning that there's four big chains of which I see are here in Yakima. Big chains, national chains, going to shut down because yeah. they're near bankrupt. So, I mean, fighting COVID is one thing and being shut down. But then we throw in this other threat, right, which is the can threat, we, which mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody saw that coming no. other than we probably should have saw it coming. Yeah. Right. In hindsight's 2020 on that is yeah. the rise of seltzers and hard seltzers and everybody else using cans. Right. And then yeah. now it's like, wait, there's a can shortage. Yeah. So what is that doing to you guys? Because I and we talked about this. I think that those that were positioned for uh, canning and distribution, whether this thing. OK, I mean, they're going to take some hits. Yeah. Those that were just tap rooms. Man, that is a tough fight. Yeah, yeah, it's it's real hard, and um, it was it was Pat, my brother in law, who was listening to I don't know what podcast it was, but it the the person who was doing the podcast had said kind of one of the interesting things is if you look at what what COVID's done is it's it's just like you know pushed all these trends like five to ten years forward, like things yep. are just accelerating, like e commerce and seltzer and other stuff. You pick it. Um, but the other thing it did is like, you know, cans since 2013 when we opened, like cans have been eating away at bottles, you know, year over year, year mm -hmm. over year, year over year. And now it's like we've just shot like five or ten years further. At, in a compressed amount of time. Yeah, right? <laughs> in, in, you know, four months. And so, yeah, it's, it's been difficult. That's, that's our biggest headache right now. Um, we were lucky that, um, you know, we, we work with two can manufacturers, Crown out of Olympia, Washington, and, and Ball, who has facilities kind of all over. Um, but I think we get most of ours out of Colorado and, and Fairfield, California. But uh, so we had two can manufacturers to start with. Um, and we had we had an agreement with Crown on, a, on an amount of pallets that, that we needed to do. And we didn't, didn't really have one with Ball, but we'd kind of order some, you know, to, to back up, um, to back up. But... Yeah, both of them are at full capacity. Um, it's a, according to to them, it's not an aluminum shortage. It's mm -hmm. there are literally no more minutes Production. in the day that they can that they can print on cans, and both are doing big expansions. Um, uh, Crown and Olympia is adding a third line. They currently have two, so they're up mm -hmm. in their capacity by fifty percent. You know, Ball I think is working on multiple facilities. I know of at least two: one in Arizona and one on the East Coast somewhere, but. You know, it's not like snapping fingers. It's what I tell the distributors sometimes. Like, we're not making widgets. So, like, you can't tell me you want X amount of beer and then tell me you want 2X right. beer right. in, like, now. It doesn't it's work like, that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's the same way. So both are going to be online, you know, somewhere in July, August of next year. So, I mean, we still got a year to deal with this. And you guys are um, ordering blanks, though. Is a, and a lot of people are ordering blanks and have gone to the wrapper that goes on the blanks. And Yeah. Luckily, one of the things that we had done early on, um, when we weren't going to be able to release a lot of these one-offs draft only like we wanted to, uh, we went out and purchased um, an automated labeler, and that got to us about a month or so ago, a month, six weeks ago. Um, and so that will help. Um, but, you know, we, we have this saying here that there's, like, COVID rules. It's, like, stuff that's, like, you know, really? Should we put a year-round can and wrap it, like, you know, pre-COVID, we're like, nah, we wouldn't do that. We'll just wait to get to printing cans. But, like, in COVID, it's like, there's no rules. Like, we're... Well, I can tell you, Boneyard, I interviewed them in February pre-COVID, yeah. or early side of COVID, but nobody really knew what was going to happen. John Van Duzer is like, we will never can our beer ever, flat out, never. Boneyard will not do that. We rely on tap handle and distribution by barrel. Yeah. And I'm like, all right. And then, so it was interesting, in April, I started sitting, seeing RPM and Diablo and stuff hit the shelf, and I'm like... <laughs> It's the COVID rule, right? Yeah. Like, Barley Brown did the same thing yeah, with Pallet yeah, Jack, man. Yeah. I'm like, Pallet Jack's in a can? And, yeah. man, it was like the Costco frenzy. People were firing yeah. for Pallet Jack, right? Yeah. But it's stuff that didn't exist pre-COVID. Right. And then stuff people had to pivot on very quickly to make a decision. All right, how do I get beer out to people? So Yeah, I mean, we, 
I mean, you know, we, we've heard the saying, you know, people say kind of innovate or die. And it's like in the COVID time, it sure is like, you know, if you're a tap room that's doing 100% of the stuff over the counter and then someone tells you you got to shut your tap room down for two months, like you either <laughs> figure it out or you close your doors. Like there's not like... It's 100%. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we've, we've re-looked at our, at our models. Um, and I mean, and then it's just constantly changing, right? There's just new information all the time. There's new information all the time. So it's kind of like you know, we have a production kind of management meeting every every day or production marketing sales meeting uh, every day uh, every week and you know it's like all right well we make a plan and it's like all right well that's that's the plan today and then a week from today when we meet again it might be different because we're going to have a whole bunch of new information um but i think the thing that's really kind of slowing everything down or at least slowing our orders from our distributors down is this uncertainty right Mm -hmm. so they got they got stuck with all this beer um you know we had 1,200 kegs in our cooler when everything shut down. Um, and the freshest stuff we were able to push back into the bright tank and can. Sweet. Um, but we still probably destroyed 1,000 kegs. And then, and then we had, you know, kegs at the distributor. And then we're like, all right, well, go back to the quality thing. And, like, you're pride in your product leaving your facility. It's like, well, we, we just decided that we were going to destroy 1,000 kegs that are the same age as the ones in the distributor. Mm. And then so... We went out and started talking to the distributor and said, hey, like, this is our plan. What do you want to do? Um, uh, we were lucky that our, our kind of sm- not smaller distributors, but um, like our distributors in like Oregon and stuff that don't have as much product just because we don't do enough, as much volume yet there. Um, they were able to work through it. They, they had some different plans, like our Portland distributor, um, you know, talking about kind of pivoting and innovating. It's like they had all this draft beer, but they didn't have any accounts to sell it at. So you're allowed to do dock sales in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So they pushed out a bunch of dock sales and and people are locked at home. You know, they're, they were doing kegs and they, well, in Oregon and Idaho, we're in a totally different place than Washington for a while too. So I think that kind of helps the dynamics as well is that look, I mean, tap rooms are open and doing self distribution, especially the crowd. There's a growler place on every single corner in Portland. So you can get some of the beer on those tap handles Mm -hmm. there versus here. Things were were just locked down for so long. It was, yeah, there was nothing. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and so we ended up destroying all that beer, and we we kind of went at it in steps. It's like, all right, you you have inventory for a rate of sale that was like I don't know how many x more than it is now. So, let's say conservatively, you're going to sell half of this. Mm-hmm. Let's take the oldest half, let's destroy it right now, right, and then and then in a month. You know, going back to getting new information. In a month, there's going to be new information. We're going to figure something out. We're going to see what the rate of sale is. We're going to see if things are going to open up. But that's backwards to normal distribution, right? Right. I'm getting rid of the old stuff first, and that's risky. That's totally... Well, and we, but we were destroying it, right? <laughs> right. Well, that's so, the thing is that yeah. normally old stuff goes out, yeah. right? It's normal stocking, right? Yeah. Old stuff goes out so I can get that on, but I'm going to destroy this yeah. and push the newest stuff first because and, we want to maintain quality. Right. Right. And, that's, and we knew we weren't going to sell through all of it, right? Right. So it's like... To me, then it makes it easy, right? Like they said, there's no chance we're going to do this. And I mean, we now have four salespeople, you know, one in Oregon, one in Western Washington, one in Central Washington, one in Eastern uh, Washington, Northern Idaho. And they're every day they're looking at their rate of sale, you know, and they're looking right. at that and they're talking with the distributors. And they're, I mean, we were on it and we was like, that, there's no way we're going through this beer. So then it becomes easy. It's like, hey, we're going to have to destroy this beer later or let's destroy it now and let's get some fresher beer out there. And then hopefully with fresher beer out there, you're going to sell more of it. Right. And our, our main distributor is, is Odom. Um, they handle most of Western Washington and then everywhere east of the Cascades and the 10 Northern counties of Idaho. And so, uh, and they're, they were totally on board. They said, sure. Um, they're like, yeah, we'll do it. And then in a month, we'll see if we need to destroy more or, um, but yeah, so. So Legends of Brewing. So we talked about Sierra Nevada. We talked about the people over New Belgium. If you could sit down with two legends, either alive or dead, who would you sit down with? Uh, this is that influencer question, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think luckily we, we, we get to. I mean, I think our, our three most influential kind of breweries and, and people, like I said, we, we've, we've talked about is definitely Ken Grossman in Sierra Nevada. Um, and then Odell has been great to us. 
uh, Brendan McGivney and Doug and Wynn. Um, our keg line is actually um, our semi-automatic keg line that, that we got was a used one that they had. They bought it brand new in 2000, mm -hmm. and we were running way over budget in our 2016 expansion, and we, we, we were doing Sierra Nevada Beer Camp, and uh, we got to pick five breweries out of this region to do it with, and one of the bre breweries we chose was Odell, and we were doing a pilot batch there, and we're walking around talking to Brendan, and he says, oh, yeah, this is one of the last days we're going to have this line. And I was like, really? I was like, is something wrong with it? He's like, no, it's a workhorse. It's like it's 16 years old, but it still does, you know, 60 kegs an hour and blah, blah, blah. And I said, man, we're looking at this two-head, this Comac thing, and it's going to be, you know, 30 maybe, and blah, blah, blah. And he says, how much are they selling it to you for? And I said, oh, it's, it's X. He says, I'll go talk to Doug. Uh, he's like, we can, we can sell you this line that was more than twice as fast with a boiler and with a whole bunch of, of spare and replacement parts for it. He says, I bet you we can sell it for less than that. And then he sends us an email and says, that's doing it. But then, and then obviously Vinny and Natalie, um, you know, on the, on the beer side, um, you know, that was, that was a big influence. But I mean, I'm all three, all three of those, I mean, Vinny has this saying that he says, what would Ken do? Like, if you're talking about something and it's like, what, do you, like, what would Ken do? Like, you know, if you make the decision that you think King Grossman will make, you're probably going to make the right decision, whether it's how you treat your employees, whether it's, right. uh, you know, what charities you're going to do, you know, you know, what beers to make. Like, should you dump a beer that you know is going to be bad? You know, it's like that. But then also kind of, you know, Pliny and, and you know, the um, elder and, and younger, you know, those were like in our early days, it was just like mind blowing, mind -blowing beers legendary beers, us. right? And so, um, I mean, those three, and, and luckily we get it. I mean, there's, I mean, in a normal time, like we probably, right now, the hop quality group would probably be coming in. And so, you know, that's a ton of, you know, the top brewers, you know, Stones in there and New Belgium and all these people. And um, I mean, there's, like I said, we, we were so fortunate to be helped by people that had a lot of experience and they were a total open book. And, you know, we could, hey, this is how we're thinking of dry hopping. Oh, I've, I've tried that dry hop technique. That's pretty good. You know, I've tried this temperature. Try that. Maybe try this. That's what I'm, this is exactly what I'm doing now. You know, it's like, you know, we're, we're thinking about harvesting yeast and what temperature to have it at and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, everyone's just a complete open book. And so, I mean, there's probably more that, that I've missed. But, um, and definitely for, for Megan and I, you know, as being a husband and wife, like Vinny and Natalie that, that run a brewery and mm -hmm. we're a husband and wife that run a brewery. And so, you know, when they come to town, um, you know, we, you know, you swap kind of the same stories cause you're, <laughs> cause you're going through there. So, uh, but yeah. And Any legends? So anybody that's not around anymore that you'd, you'd sit, if you had the chance, if you had the chance to go backwards, I mean, you guys have been in the brewery scene for a while, right? I mean, Hop farmers, yeah, the whole thing. So you've had the chance to meet. I mean, I think I think it would be great to have a, a beer with Bert Grant. That would be um, fantastic. You know, especially being in this town, and he was kind of a pioneer. And uh, I mean, for still, the region, he's I mean, I mean yeah. flat out, yeah, yeah. So. I think it'd be cool. I hear he's a hell of a character, or was. Um, so I think that'd be great to have a beer with him. Good. Good. All right. Well, so my last question. So most mind blowing beer that you've had in the last thirty days, and best you've ever had. Yeah, and it's um, not it's not in vogue to pick your own either. So you can do. Yeah, well, I, I was I was just <laughs> looking at that, and when Megan and I were looking at these questions, I'm like, I haven't been anywhere in the last thirty <laughs> days. Like the only thing I've been drinking is our beer because everything's on lockdown. Uh, so I definitely I would say some of the like the most influential beers that we've had. I would say Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. You know, I went to college in 2000, so. You know, when I turned 21 in um, whatever that be, 2003, you know, that was like, to me, that was just like a mind blowing. Like, that right. is so hoppy, you know, and it's now we kind of we joke around uh, both Field 41 and, and Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, at least at one point, we're both 38 IBUs. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, ours probably finishes at 1.8 Play Doh and, and Pale Ale is probably five, but uh, I mean, there's a different balance <laughs> right, on there. Totally. But, um, uh, oh, and Steve Dressler too. He was 
he's such a nice guy and helped us out so much, and, and Tom from Sierra Nevada. But then um, definitely Pliny um, and uh, Odell IPA. So when, when Megan and I were, when we were getting into home brewing and stuff, we were living in Coeur d'Alene, and Odell distributes in Idaho, but it still, still doesn't distribute in Washington. And I remember having an, an Odell IPA for the thing, and it was like, you know, go back, you know, seven years or whatever, six, seven years, um, and having like that, that one and, and Pliny too were like so much hot flavor, right. you know, and, and aroma at the time. Um, and I would say, I would say those three are huge. I mean, even Dogfish Head 90 Minute, I remember first having yeah. that. Um, it's interesting how you remember your first in those particular styles and you're like, for me, that kind of sets the stage. Bridgeport IPA for me. Yeah. I mean, that one gold medal after gold medal. That yeah. was the standard that yeah. became irrelevant, hence why they went out. But it didn't even meet the standard in the class anymore because things evolved, right? And yeah, I mean, and we um, were, I remember when we released Top Cutter, talking with Manny, and they had Lucille out, and he was like, you know, this has so much, you know, like, what's your hopping rate and that stuff, you know, and it's like, but I remember drinking Lucille, you know, this this little pub down the road from our house in Coeur d'Alene and just being like, and Boot Jack, when Boot Jack IPA from Ice Cold came out, you know, it's like, and now you have them, they're still great beers, but like you said, right. it's it's a different style. But like now some people even say that about Top Cutter. It's three plus pounds per barrel hopping rate. And, and you know, almost all of that is in, you know, Whirlpool and Dry Hop. And, you know, some people are still kind of like, mm, you know, it's not hazy, but, you know. But or it's not what it was. I remember the original batches and they were truly better, <laughs> but it's the same thing, right? And to me, that's what's fascinating about Pliny or uh, Sticky Hands yeah. or some of these ones that are kind of up there in the class. And yeah. people are like, these are the gold standards of what the, this particular beer is. And I'm like, how do they sustain? Because so many were so great. And then people are like, they're not the same once they started overproducing. No, it's the same recipe, yeah. but the legend lives of these yeah. other ones, right? Yeah, and I think, too, you know, like you were saying, your first experience with one is, like, so high. And then you've set this bar, like, so high, you know, that it was, you know, it was like like a religious experience, you know, right. um, that then it's like the next time you have it, you're kind of like, wait a minute. <laughs> but, you know, no one can live up to, to all that, but... Uh, yeah. So past thirty days, what, you, we we got the best ever and kind of that in class. The, pa the past thirty days, what are you impressed with? Um, our our quality sensing manager Jackie, who you um, met, did a um, a wheat ale, which is not a, typically a, a, a thing that we do um, with guava and hibiscus. We call it pinwheel party, hmm. uh, and. Like you were saying, we're known for, you know, hoppy, hoppy beers, whether they're West Coast or, or hazies. And so this, this you know, almost zero hop, you know, wheat beer with guava and hibiscus. Uh, and it's absolutely excellent. And I had absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, but I, I, it's a perfect beer for right now. And I'm just, it's too bad that it's in the time that we are and we can't get it out more. But it's a, it's a beer that really showcases you know, if you're a good, if you're a really good brewery and you're a really good brewer, like you can have your favorite styles of beers that you like, but you can make any style of beer. Um, and so I think it's cool when we make beers like that. And, you know, we haven't been doing it as much now because we don't really have an outlet for it, but we've been getting into kettle sours too. I don't have you really. Um, we're doing some barrel aging stuff. Um, we have some 750s. Um, we've been doing, we have a partnership with Jameson, so we have a ton of, we have a ton of, uh, whiskey barrel age stuff, but then we have some really cool projects, um, that, um, that are in the works where we've done some stuff with some wineries around here. Um, we've done some, uh, stuff with some cideries, you know, we're doing some barrel aging in that. You that, distilling at all? Are you getting involved in distilling? No. Um, <laughs> it seems to be like the thing that's next, like on the cusp, right? Yeah. I mean, we totally wouldn't be against it. I think it, I think it's another cool thing, you know, is, is if we start growing this 
this, you know, barley grain business a little, you know, if we, we continue to make more of that, I think it'd be really cool to, is the case for your bad batches of beer, the beers that don't have quality control. Yeah, right? what I was gonna what yeah. I was gonna say is, does it count that we gave away all of our bottom cutter half barrels to local distilleries to make hand sanitizer? Like, if that's getting into distilling, that is community were. based, right there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, Kevin, thanks for your time, buddy. I appreciate the uh, information um, and your time and everything. And Absolutely, I think the listeners are gonna eat this interview up flat out. So yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the the one other thing I think you said yep. that uh, one of the things were just kind of like the tips and the tricks that kind of home brewers. Yeah, perfect. Um, and one of the things that that the brewers told us when you know when we were getting to go to like CBC and stuff because of the hop farm and we were telling them that we were home brewing and stuff is just be obsessive about cleaning and sanitizing. Mm-hmm. Like there's sh- there's not an excuse to make infected beer. So just be obsessive about cleanliness and, and sanitizing. And, and, you know, the first homebrew book I read told me, you know, things can be clean and not sanitary and things can be sanitary and not clean. You need to make sure they're clean and they're sanitary and be, you know, like I said, be OCD about that. And that'll really help the, the quality of the batches. Cause I'd say, you know, as a whole, um, there's, quite a few of like the homebrew batches that local people will, will bring in and say, Hey, I tried this. Can you try it? Um, you know, there's a fair percentage that have some sort of infection in it or something. I would which, say a large percentage. I mean, yeah. just, it's tough to get things clean at home. A couple squirts of star sand doesn't yeah. do it. And, yep. But yeah. And so we would, uh, yeah. And so that's, that's the thing. Just be obsessive about that and, and, you know, cleaning the beer, cleaning the cornies, cleaning the bottles, whatever you're doing, you know, cl- and clean in, sanitize all, all those that you can and and clean beer tastes a whole lot better (laughs) sage sage advice so all right man well thanks for the interview and uh yeah cheers close it out cheers all right kevin quinn bail breaker the amount of knowledge (laughs) that was dumped in that one interview is disgusting I'm telling you. Oh, it's it's that's like gold. Kevin, um, <laughs> that Absolutely interview was phenomenal. So I've listened to it a couple times now, and um, I'm blown away each time. I take something totally different away each time, and the amount of access I had to the brewery, to um, their cask and their sour beer program, and all. I mean. Their centrifuge, looking at their quality control stuff. I mean, unbelievable. Like, literally, they believe in quality control. And um, when he talks about a five-step program and every person from the... uh, From the... The base packaging guy. Guy cleaning to the guy packaging to the guy loading it out the door. If they see something wrong... If they see something wrong, they... Out it goes. Raise so. the red flag and go address it. Which is a big deal, right? That's huge. Yeah, so that's uh, their top cutter is the same top cutter that people have been drinking since it was released. Yep. And um, and all of the other beers are exactly the same way. They're all treated equally. So, and, and One of the things that I don't think a lot of our listeners may understand is when they were talking about having like a a reserve type thing going on where they grow their own grain, they grow their own hops. Right. Everything's like in-house, right? Well, when he started talking about the tonnage that they were using, (laughs) (laughs) for listeners, have you ever picked up like just a strand of barley or a strand of wheat? It weighs nothing. So did... To come up with the tonnages that he was talking about, <laughs> that's freaking mind blowing. Well, so how much has to be dedicated to that? Yeah, Loftus Farms, I guess the uh, kind of I don't know if I would call them parent company, but we'll call it for lack of a better term. Um, Loftus Farms owns massive amount of acres in the Yakima Valley, and yeah. they, I mean they produce a shit ton of hops. So. And Bale Breaker, which he talks about, Field 41, where their uh, brewery sits, yes. four acres carved out 
It literally sits amongst the hop fields. Yeah. It's gorgeous. You pull in, and during a midsummer day, you've got these huge, tall hop vines with golden clusters sitting there. And here's this beautiful microbrew place. And, right in the of and it's not little. This is a macrobrew. Man, this place is freaking huge. <laughs> and everything. All of these guys talked about. So if you go to Hop City or Hop Capital or you go to uh, any of these different places, um, they're all talking about you need to go check out Bail Breaker. Yeah. And it literally is everything everybody built up. So It's like the Disneyland of breweries. Yeah, no, it's it's beautiful and a great place. So Kevin and Megan have done a great job building this thing with the other Kevin. I didn't meet the other Kevin. Yeah. Um, but that being said, beautiful place. I think the things that I took away this time hearing in the interview is this Ace Hardware in Yakima. That thing rocks. Dude. <laughs> it, it carries your your all your equipment. All your grains, all your hops. <laughs> I mean, he's talking about going in there and buying out their corny keg supply. Ridiculous. At an Ace supply store? Yeah. Come on. What's my Ace doing, dude? They don't Not sell that. half that shit. No, hell no. <laughs> they don't sell any of that. I need to open a freaking Ace Hardware right yes. here in Tigard. Yep. And I'm opening a homebrew store. And so. three quarters of it is homebrew. The other <laughs> quarter is like the hardware you need. To support your homebrew yeah. shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this thing's ridiculous. So um, I do want to do a shout-out. The Pinwheel Party Guava Hibiscus beer that he talked yeah. about, yeah. we've had. We actually had it the last two weeks. We did have that. And it is ridiculously good. It's a hot summer beer, totally unlike anything else they produced. Debbie was drinking it. She digs it. Yeah. Um, you find that Pinwheel Party, man, it's it good. Up. Yep, it's good. So I've got one of their experimental beers. This thing's unlabeled, um, and it was fresh. It's part of their barrel age program. Okay. So we're going to pull this bad boy out, see what they got. Um, Kevin did say that he was going to send me the... Uh-oh. <laughs> it looks like a Belgian <laughs> Abbey um, type of yeast. Well, there's a lot of uh, carb coming out of this thing. <laughs> that thing launched out of there like a freaking bullet. Because I remember what happened with your Belgian yeast. Yeah, well, we we saw that last night. So, yeah. well, no matter so, which beer got opened with the Belgian yeast, I don't it, know what it's like a this fountain. is. But he was supposed to like uh, send me something, and I haven't seen it yet. But uh, might have got lost in the mail. Yeah, I'm gonna give you this glass. So this is uh, one that's unlabeled. This smells like a sour to me. So can't promise really? you it's sour. Oh, yeah, that's, that yeah, smells sour. like a sour. So this is part of their sour program. That's why it shot out of there like a freaking rocket. So super clean. Not really. Actually, no, that is actually fairly clean for it's, a sour. It's clean and funky. Um, if it can be such a thing. It, it doesn't have that really kind of nasty tartness on the back end that a lot of sours have. Right. Uh, you get the initial sour taste and then a very clean finish on it. Yeah. It's uh, it's good. A little golden color, a little cloudy. And, uh, again, I don't think it's a mixed firm. Just a little hint of, like, clove in that sourness. Belgian-y sour yeah. slash clove type thing. A little very, bit of banana smell. Very so. interesting. So, good. Well, um, again, thanks, Kevin. Uh, awesome interview. So hopefully the listeners enjoy that one. Uh, so we will take a quick break, enjoy this, and come back with news about homebrew and Oktoberfest 2020. When the only sound is the frozen silence of winter, you go to work. Throwing mountains of snow back into the sky. And when the track becomes a railroad again, it's Miller time. Time to head for the best tasting beer you can find. Miller High Life. If you've got the time, we've got the beer. Miller Beer. Miller Beer. All right, we're back. Mountains of snow. 
Old Fashioned Miller. Yeah. Doesn't compare to this bell breaker I'm oh, drinking. Oh, hell no. Not even close. Better beer by far. By far. Well, so uh, Oktoberfest 2020 happened last night. Yes, it did. We're still standing. We're still drinking. Yeah, it, uh, it actually, with a COVID twist, turned out just fine. Yeah, no, I think it. Uh, that was a pretty good time. So, a bunch of people there. Not sure it was totally COVID friendly, but uh, um, you know, it. I looked at that. I really did. Um, and when when you looked at the overall spacing and everything else that was going on, I th- I think it did a really good job with the number of people that were there of being COVID friendly. Yeah, I think uh, a lot or of hand sanitizer. COVID environment friendly. A lot of wipes. A lot yeah. of social distancing. Yeah, yeah. Big, huge uh, movie screen. 20-foot movie screen with uh, live streaming Mount Angel Oktoberfest. <laughs> uh, blew the keg in about two and a half hours. Yeah, that didn't take long. Blew your keg. Uh, one gallon you had left in your yeah, keg in about an hour. Yeah, that didn't take long at all. Yeah, and then uh, the Marzen slash Oktoberfest uh, blew in a couple hours. Yep. And then we were down to bottles. And I would say there was a couple cases of bottle that we, bottles that we went through. So. And the funny thing is, is it, it was kind of like a high school party. As soon as the kegs blew, yeah, everybody people started disappearing. Yeah. So the lesson there is we need to have multiple kegs. Then people will stay. Oh, we do. But when, the downfall which means is I just need to make sure I get brew in the keg next year. Well, yeah. yeah. So that was a downfall. But that said, we wouldn't be here today if we had another keg yes. or two. On, on the plus side, yeah. we were still standing. We could function today. And uh, not only function, but... A function without a hangover. I was highly productive today. Yeah. So managed to have everything tore down by about nine. Set up the Halloween decorations. Uh, cleaned up the brewing area. Right. Pulled the Black Widow off of the dredges from the bottom. So yep. I went to secondary. And um, thought about moonshining and it didn't work out. So, yep. What happened to the moonshine? Uh, I thought about popping it in the distiller or in the still, and uh, decided not to because I didn't want to rush it. So okay. I want I want a full day with it just in case something happens. Yeah, you don't want to screw with it. Yeah, so I watched a little uh, Tim and Tickle on <laughs> Discovery Channel to inspire myself, and uh, <laughs> still you, you weren't in the overalls, were you? No, I was in my boxer shorts, sitting on the couch. Can't. Can't say that my hand wasn't in the front of my boxer shorts. All right, either. we're done right there. <laughs> so, yeah, well, you know what? It's going to happen. And I'm. And after that apple pie moonshine we drank last night that uh, yeah, it, it we didn't had. didn't survive. It wasn't mine. There but was nothing left. It wasn't mine, but somebody else. <laughs> They made some good apple pie moonshine. Wow, and they did. It was that that little mason jar got obliterated. <laughs> yeah, they killed that thing. So. Nothing left. And Sur- I have to say, Shirley <laughs> was the one that kicked that off. Well, she's like seventy five, man, <laughs> yeah. and she was like and that pounding was that away. First thing she wanted to try yeah. was that. So funny stories. So she goes out today, and uh, her and her husband. They shoot off and they go to the uh, OLCC liquor store here in uh, <laughs> Guess what they the got. area, and they found some apple pie moonshine. <laughs> and she comes running over and had like she's like, "Look what I got!" And I'm like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> you created a monster. That's literally what she said, almost word for word. She's like, "You've yep. created a monster." I'm like, "I didn't create nothing." <laughs> so, you all did that yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's uh, priceless. Yeah, this is this is next level stuff. So, but um, that said, it was a good time. Good sausage, good crowd on the cast iron. It was fantastic. Uh, great chicken breasts with pretzel coating on it. Well, thank you. The food itself, uh, I think there was plenty of food. We all took away some food. So um, we did. Yep. And I would say 25, 30 people. So hopefully everybody's safe, and hopefully we don't see any COVID. So yeah, I don't think we will. Yeah, the, I don't moon, think so the moonshine killed it. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> well, so uh, I've got massive 
kudos, a massive thanks to say. Uh, the Yakima Valley was n- very supportive of the podcast, very supportive of the interviews. So a huge thanks to uh, the folks in the Yakima Valley and the brew scene. If you made it on the Yakima Beer Month, um, again, awesome. Thank you. Those that didn't make it on, I appreciate it. I know I talked to a bunch of you guys. But uh, call out Chris Baum from Varietal. Yep. Again, awesome access, awesome interview. Learned a ton about the brewery, how you guys founded yourselves, why Sunnyside, um, your your obsession with sour beers, which is cool. Um, Caleb from Yakima Valley Hops, awesome. Um, wow. The gift basket you guys gave was, was ridiculous. That was insane. So, um, but more importantly, um, the hops that you guys are producing and the new technology as it relates to home brewers and macro level brewers um, is huge. So, um, again, thanks, Caleb. Um, when we look at the guys over the tap, so a brand new tap house in Yakima, which is a self serve tap house. Brilliant um, idea. Brilliant idea. You can brilliant. walk up, you can control your own beer, and these guys are truly groundbreaking. Um, and it's happening in Yakima. Um, again, thanks for the access. And, and that that whole model really fits post COVID, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely right. So, and then Kevin uh, over at Bell Breaker again, awesome interview, great access, great hospitality, fantastic beers, man. <laughs> yeah. um, the quality on it is like unparalleled, and. Um, I hate the fact that they're over in Seattle at those Seattle sports teams. And, uh, I'm not a fan of those places. Yeah, I'd rather be there at the uh, sure. Portland Timbers. Uh, do what? There's always a chance. Well, we could. They distribute to Oregon. They, they could. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd rather they're in Portland and not Seattle, but I get business as business. So uh, <laughs> with that, I won't hold it against you. Uh, but again, Yakima's awesome, and we didn't hit... I mean, I, I visited a lot of places, right. and I've talked to a lot of people over there, and I've had beers in just about all the places you can have beers in the Yakima Valley. So the interviews you got are top-notch, but again, maybe next year we get a few more. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, what else we got? You brewing anything? No. When are you um, going to brew? <laughs> You got a Christmas beer you got to start. Uh, no, I know. I've got a good Christmas beer out there. But um, as you brought up in the last podcast, I still have preventive maintenance to do <laughs> um, that I keep putting off because it's such a pain in the ass. Every week, it I just goes by. I need eight arms to be able to do the soldering that I need to do. You got three. Um, yeah. No, oh, no, no. Actually, I don't. <laughs> You that don't? one gets burnt by the solder every time. Oh, okay. Well, so we got to get you brewing again. Yeah. Um, um, Andrew, I, I plan on getting that done. Andrew was at the party last night. He was. Yeah, yes. and he's talking about wanting to do a sour beer. So we got to get him started on we that. We could jump on that. Yep. Um, and then, yeah. Johnny was missing. Yeah, I don't know where He's Johnny our was. other brewer that we got to get going again. Yeah, one time brewer. We got to bounce him out. I was over at Value Village today, dropping off some stuff. And you know what was on the shelf? Mr. Beer. Mr. Beer. Five dollars ninety nine cents of Mr. Beer. Almost bought it, just to give it to, gift it to somebody else. Yeah. Um, I don't know who would gift it to. Give it to Rich. Rich? I'm not so sure. Rich would be commit to brewing. Why not? I don't know. I he don't... used to have beer fridges full of kegs. Yeah. He could brew his own stuff. I don't think he would. No. A lot of these guys are switching to hard alcohol because of the weight and calories and oh, all that stuff. Oh, a bunch of pussies. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. They're uh, doing that or they're doing, hey, look at this figure. This is White Claw. Well, and that was Joshy. Joshy yeah. was all about his that's, White that's Claw. That's why I wanted right? to call Joshy yeah. out on that. Yeah, he's like, I dropped 20 pounds. I'm <laughs> just drinking White Claw. I don't even have to work White out. Claw. All I do is drink White Claw. I'm like, why would you drink White Claw? Shit. So. All right, man. Well, I think we close this bad boy out. And again, massive thanks to the team over at Bell Breaker and Kevin, Megan. Thank you. Um, With that, we close this bad boy out. 
We have interviews set up for next week with hopefully Watts Brewing over uh, in Seattle. Okay. Um, and also you are dialed in. Yeah, hopefully, I'm trying to work yours. on, uh, what is it, Silver Falls? Silver Falls Brewing. Yeah. You got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so hopefully we uh, come back to Oregon uh, and do that. And then I also have a couple in the hopper for Wenatchee as well. So Fantastic. I think we're set up for the next month or so. Oh, Black Widow. We didn't talk Black Widow. So we'll te- talk ne- Black Widow on the next one. We'll actually have some samples of that. Yeah. Uh, maybe do a side by side with my Black Widow. Oh, fresh out of the keg. Fresh. Yeah, so we'll have to see how that goes. I'm going to transfer it to the keg midweek this week and go from there. So, I'm ready. all right, brother, let's get out of here. Sounds good. Tim beers. Thanks for listening to the Portland Tim Beers Podcast. Be sure to visit the Portland Tim Beers Podcast on ACAST.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. If you love the Tim Beers Podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes. Until next time, Tim Beers. Tim Beers.